<clears throat> um, the inorganic portion would be mineral salt. So the bone cells and the inorganic um, substances um, play two major roles in the um, structure of bone. The organic components provide the structures with its flexibility, tensile strength that allows it to risk and, and um, resist stretch and twisting. The organic components, they consist of hydroxyapatites or mineral salts provide the bone with its hardness. Number two, what is ossification or osteogenesis? Um, basically, it is the process of bone formation. There are two types of um, bone formation or ossification. The first is endochondrial, and the second one is intramembranous. So number three, what is the duration for bone growth? Bone growth, which is another form of ossification, starts at the age of two and then continues into early adulthood. Again, starts at the age of two and continues into early adulthood. But number four is asking you to list the two types of ossification and provide a characteristic for each. So on your sheet, I've provided a characteristic for each of the two types. Your first blank is endochondrial ossification. Bone develops by replacing hyaline cartilage, resulting in a cartilage or an endochondrial bone. And then the second is the intramembranous, where bone develops by fibrous membrane, and the bone is called um, a membrane bone. Cartilage and membranes accommodate mitosis, which allows the skeleton to grow easily. Um, I would put a star by these two items and underline hyaline cartilage and endochondrial and fibrous membrane and intramembranous. Um, knowing the different type of tissue that is involved with the bone growth process, I believe will be beneficial in you knowing the difference of each. All right, for question number five. What is formed during intramembranous ossification? All right, intramembranous ossification forms the, the cranial bones of the skull and the clavicles. Um, all of these are your flat bones. This process starts with the fibrous connective tissue formed by mesenchymal cells. So in this diagram, it shows you intramembranous ossification. Um, mesenchymal cells have been identified. It shows you blood capillaries. Um, the condensing of mesenchyme into a soft sheet permeated with blood capillaries. Then you will have the disposition, I'm sorry, the deposition of osteoid tissues and osteoid glass. Excuse me, if you remember from chapter six, part A, we talked about the different functions of each of these bone cells. Um, it goes on to show you the formation of the honeycomb structure, which we refer to as the trabeculae, formed by mineral deposits, creation of spongy bone. And then uh, finally, the surface of the bone will be filled in with the deposition, converting spongy bone into compact bone, persistent to spongy bone into the middle layer. All right, number six, where does long bone formation typically, or well, where does it typically begin? Um, it's going to begin at a highland cartilage um, line location. It is The highland cartilage is used as a model or a template for the formation of these bones, which is called the endochondrial bones. This is the process for the development of most of the skeletal bones. Number six, where does long bone formation typically begin? I said number six, I apologize. Yeah, that was right, number six. Um, that was the one I just did, number six at the Highland Cartilage Line. Okay, number seven, 
What cells are the fibrous connective tissues of the intramembranous ossification derived from? So all of the tissues that are involved in the ossification come from mesenchymal cells. Um, you may also have referred to them as embryonic stem cells. The ossification forms the bones of the skull and the clavicle. Most bones in the body that are flat are formed through this process. All right, for number eight, we're looking at the five zones of cartilage association um, associated with long bone growth. So these zones um, actually have a particular role in the growth of long bone um, that occurs at the epiphyseal plate as long as the plate is open. So I'm gonna start with the resting zone and give you a brief description and then I'll go all the way down um, to the um, trabeculae, trabecular, I'm sorry, zone. All right, first is the resting zone. Cartilage on the epiphyseal side of the ep epiphyseal plate is relatively inactive in the resting zone. Cartilage on the epiphyseal side of the epiphyseal plate is relatively inactive. So that means that there's not a lot of growth occurring at this particular point. The second zone is proliferation. Um, it may also be referred to as the growth zone. Cartilage at the, on the diaphysis side of the epiphyseal plate is rapidly dividing, pushing the epiphysis away from the diaphysis lengthening the bone. So the, the largest portion of um, bone lengthening will occur at the proliferation zone. The pre-hypertrophic zone and the hypertrophic zone um, together is the location of older chondrocytes. Um, they have a, a closer location to that diaphysis and their lacunae enlarge and erode. So it's a place of interconnecting spaces where you can see um, there's some structural changes um, in the pre and hypertrophic zone. The trabeculae zone is gonna be the calcification zone. Um, it's surrounding cartilage matrix, it'll calcify, the chondrocytes will die in this area and then start to deteriorate. This slide just kind of goes into a little bit more detail. Um, rather than having the same names as the previous, it has, um, more, uh, I guess, like a combined set of names. Um, the resting zone, proliferation zone, hypertrophic zone, calcification zone, and os ossification zone. All right, we're moving on to number nine. So what happens during epiphyseal plate closure? So basically what is occurring is your, your body is approaching the end of adolescence. So bone lengthening will stop or end. So long bone growth ends when mitosis slows down and the epiphyseal plate becomes thinner and thinner until the epiphysis and the diaphysis fuse and leaves a line where the plate formerly was. This process is called epiphyseal plate closure and tends to occur around the age of 18. So if you can see in these two diagrams, this is when you are still actively in adolescence and your epiphyseal plate is open. But as you mature and reach adulthood, um, and the ages will vary based on each individual, but you will see a, a, a thinning of the line showing that the, the growth um, has ended. Hmm. 
number 10, what is the role of the osteo, what role do the osteoblasts play in oppositional growth? I'm sorry, oppositional growth. Ooh, excuse me. Um, oppositional growth, which is growth in width or thickness. Please put a star beside this. You will need to know which one increases the thickness of the bone and which one increases the, um, the length of the bone. All right, so to answer number 10, appositional growth can occur at the endosteum or periosteum where osteoclasts reabsorb old bone that lines the medullary cavity. Again, appositional growth can occur at the endosteum or periosteum where osteoclasts reabsorb old bone that line the medullary cavity. Clast, C-L-A-S-T, are the ones that do the reabsorption. Blast, B-L-A-S-T, are the ones that produce new bone matrix. Um, in adult life though, bones undergo a constant remodeling in which reabsorption of old or damaged bones takes place on the same surface where the osteoblasts are. So as the blasts are laying out new bone, um, it is also um, having old bone being reabsorbed by the class. So injury, exercise, other activities are what's gonna um, produce uh, bone remodeling. Number 11, what are the hormones associated with bone growth regulation? So on the slide, the hormones that are involved in bone growth, the first one is growth hormone, second is the thyroid hormones, and third is the testosterone and estrogen. So your growth hormone is the most important stimulus of the epiphyseal plate activity in children. Um, it, again, it is active at infancy and throughout childhood. The thyroid hormone modulates the activity of growth hormones. It ensures that the skeleton has a proper proportion as it grows. And then finally, if I can get this thing out of the way. Testosterone and estrogen promote growth spurts that occur on adolescence. They promote the masculinization and feminization of specific parts of the skeleton. Later, they induce the epiphyseal plate closure. All right, so on to number 12. What are two processes that comprise bone remodeling? Oh, crap. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, the two processes that comprise bone remodeling will consist of both bone deposit and bone reabsorption, which we kind of spoke about when we talked about the osteoclast and the osteoblast. Um, both will be at the surfaces that are being remodeled. Both are on the periosteum and the endosteum. Number 13. Describe what happens in bone remodeling. <coughs> Excuse me. So osteoblasts stimulate production by secreting collagen fibers. Remember the blasts are the cells that are producing the new bone matrix against old bone. Um, and an osteoid seam will appear. The osteoxine is an unmineralized band of matrix. The osteoclasts, which are the ones that are breaking down both new and old bone matrix, 
will reabsorb those structures into the bloodstream. This creates a transition between old bone and the osteoid seam, which is referred to as the calcification front. It is the abrupt transition zone between the osteoid seam and the older mineralized bone. So this is um, a histology slide of bone remodeling, and each one of the letters is identified by a structure. You will not need to know this for testing purposes. And we are at 14. In bone deposits, what are the unmineralized bands of gauzy looking bone matrix? Okay, so it's um, basically what we just spoke about on the last slide. All right, so the answer for 14 is the osteoid seam, which is the unmineralized band of bone matrix. And the calcification front, which is the abrupt transition zone between osteoid seam and older mineralized bone. Let's see. All right, number 15, what factors regulate and control bone remodeling? All right, the slide states that the remote the remodeling is controlled by two genetic by genetics and the two controllers. Okay. So first, um, occurs continuously, but is regulated by genetic factors and the two control loops. First being the negative feedback hormonal loop for calcium, um, which is a, a way to um, maintain the homeostasis of the calcium balances within your body. Um, it controls the blood calcium levels, not necessarily bone integrity. Number two is mechanical and gravitation forces that act on the skeleton. So these are the factors that control bottom, um, bone remodeling. Number 16, list functions of calcium in the body. All right, so calcium is necessary for the transmission of nerve impulses. It um, participates in muscle contraction, blood coagulation, secretion of glands and nerve cells, and cell division. So please take a moment and fill in these five items for number 16. Number 17, what are the hormones associated with blood calcium levels? So I have kind of pre-populated um, the hormone name, but I did not provide you with the information to support it. So the first one is PTH, which is parathyroid hormone. It is produced by the parathyroid glands. It removes calcium from bones regardless of the bone's integrity. The second one is calcitonin. It produces a parafollicular cells of the thyroid. In high doses, it lowers the blood calcium levels temporarily. So these two are associated with your blood calcium level. Number 18, for homeostasis of blood, what is the amount of calcium that is needed to be present? So please put a star by this number. Let's see if it's... Okay, it's not in the slide. Um, the correct or um, the amount that is needed to be present is that calcium homeostasis of blood needs to be between nine and 11 milligrams per 100 milliliters. Again, it needs to be between nine 
and 11 milligrams per 100 milliliters. All right, and then this diagram just kind of goes through um, how hormone regulation of calcium in blood is controlled, and it has um, an outline of how um, different hormones play a role in keeping it balanced. Number 19, every minute changes in blood calcium levels are dangerous. What is hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia? And then Wolf's Law. Okay, so I don't have a slide. <clears throat> All right, so hypocalcemia is when your calcium levels are too low. Um, it's classified as a blood calcium deficiency. Um, you have excess excitability of the nervous system or tintiny in which you have an inability to relax. So that's hypocalcemia. Hypercalcemia um, is when your osteoclasts are very active. And remember, the clasts are the ones that do the reabsorption. So your blood calcium levels are going to be too high because it's being reabsorbed back into your blood system. Your nervous system is less excitable and can actually cause you to have excess calcium deposits in your blood vessels, kidneys, and then interfere with your, um, your overall function. <clears throat> All right, number 20. <clears throat> Excuse me. What does Wolf Law state? So, Julius Wolf was a German uh, autonomist and surgeon that stated that bone growth and remodel, um, I'm sorry, that bone grows and remodels in response to force that are placed upon it in a healthy person. So if you've had a recent injury to a bone, if you're placing specific stress in a specific direction <clears throat> to the bone, it can help the remodeling and make the bone become healthy and normal again. For those of you who are looking into um, various types of physical therapy, occupational therapy, I'm sure you will look um, in more detail with what Wolf Law entails. Um, <clears throat> but again, bone growth or remodeling will occur in response to um, stress that is placed on it. Bone reflects stress they encounter. So long bone thickness midway along the diaphysis where bending stress is the greatest. Bone is stressed when um, weight bears on them or muscles pull on them. Twenty-one. What are the results of hormonal and mechanical stress? Let's see. Hard to find a good spot for that. Uh, 21. So, our hormonal controls determine whether and when remodeling occurs to changing blood calcium levels. And then, second, mechanical stress determines where remodeling occurs. So, your two bullets, excuse me, again, is that hormonal controls determine whether and when remodeling occurs to changing blood calcium levels. And the second bullet is that mechanical stress determines what remodeling occurs. <clears throat> so in this slide, it shows you a um, diagram where mechanical stress is being placed on the bone. So you have the area up where the head of the femur is located, where you have a lot of weight bearing stress applied on, on the bone. There is compression here in this area, closer to the um, epiphyseal end of the um, long bone, and it shows you where you have some tension located. So bone 
is loaded whenever weight bears down on it or muscles pull on it. The loading is usually off center and tends to bend the bone. Bending compresses the bone on one side, subject to tension or stretching on the other side. As a result, long bones are thickest midway along the diaphysis where bending and stress is the greatest. All right, 22. Despite their remarkable strength, bones are susceptible for fractures or breaks. How are fractures classified? All right, and then this just kind of goes into more detail about Wolf's Law and um, is giving it an example of how the tennis player, because of the stressors that she's placing on her um, right hand, um, has an increase in bone remodeling. Mm, and this is the answer to the one I just read to you. So this slide answers number 21. Um, what are the results of hormonal and mechanical stress? Sorry about that. All right, so we're looking at <clears throat> 22. How are fractures classified? So the fracture, fracture classification is um, actually there are two categories beyond what the um, slide is providing to you. So on your paper, I have a stress fracture and then I have a pathological fracture. So let me provide you with that information. So stress fracture is an abnormal trauma to a bone. A stress fracture is an abnormal trauma to a bone. It occurs during a fall, a car accident or sports injury. Again, it is an abnormal trauma to a bone, occurs during a fall, car accident or sports injury. The second classification is a pathological fracture. And this type occurs from disease, which has caused a bone to weaken or to break down. Pathological fractures occur from disease, which has caused the bone to weaken or to break down. All right, and so then the other portions <clears throat> are based on the position of the fracture, whether or not the fracture has broken completely, and then whether or not skin was penetrated. So um, this information has been provided, but I'll just go through it. Um, position of bone ends after the fracture. So if it's non-displaced, then the end remains <clears throat> in its normal position. And then if it is displaced, then it will, the end of the fracture will be out of its normal alignment. You can have complete break. So a complete break is when it's broken all the way through. And an incomplete break is when it's not broken all the way through. And then whether or not you have a penetration of the skin. So if the skin is penetrated, it would be an open compound fracture. And if it is not penetrated, it would be a closed simple fracture. All right, 23. What are the stages of bone repair? And I stated that there are typically four. So if you look at the um, diagram on your slide, it tells you that an inflammation soft callus, hard callus, and then remodeling occurs. So for the inflammation portion, <clears throat> you're gonna have the formation of a hematoma, um, which may also be referred to as a blood tumor. This is going to clot and fill the space. This typically occurs immediately. Um, if you have a torn blood vessel, there's hemorrhage, the clot will form, and then the site becomes swollen and it's usually very painful and inflamed. The soft callus is a fibrocartilaginous callus um, formation. The blood is broken down and then forms into the internal callus, which connects the fractures. This occurs during the normal healing process and the limb cannot be used because technically it's still broken, but there's something in place to kind of hold it together. 
<clears throat> the third step is the hard callus. So you have a bony callus forms. This takes time to appear because the spongy bone has to first form. And then the process is going to be similar to what occurs at the epiphyseal plate. It will eventually form compact bone and then reconstruct the, the, the walls of the shaft. This can last anywhere from two to several months for this process to, to be in place. And then finally, the remodeling. This occurs after the fracture has healed. Mechanical stressors continue to shape the bone as it may be disfigured after the fracture has healed. All right, so for number 24, we're looking at what two conditions are associated with occurrences due to blood calcium and uh, imbalances. So we have osteomalacia, rickets <clears throat> are the first two. So the osteomalacia is loss of calcium and phosphorus. It often occurs as a result of vitamin D deficiency, excuse me, which will lead to bone weaknesses. So your bones are poorly mineralized. Um, you're not having enough calcium salt deposits. This will cause bones to become soft, weaken, and every time that you place weight on them, you will feel pain. Rickets is a type of osteomalacia that occurs in children. Um, both are caused by insufficient calcium in the diet or by vitamin D deficiencies. Um, in children, you may notice that they have bowed legs and other bone deformities. Bone ends are enlarged or abnormally long. And then this is um, a diagram just kind of providing you with um, some images. Twenty-five. What is osteoporosis? Um, it's a group of diseases, actually. Osteoporosis refers to a group of diseases in which bone reabsorption outpaces bone deposits. So um, basically, what you have is both your osteoclasts and your osteoblasts are present, but the amount of bone cells that are being reabsorbed is greater than the amount of bone that is being, um, you know, placed back in, in the spaces. So bone reabsorption outpaces the deposits. Spongy bone of the spine and neck of the femur are usually the most susceptible areas. Vertebral and hip fractures are common when osteoporosis is um, in occurrence. 26, ask who is at risk for osteoporosis. Um, in order for healthy bone growth and repair to occur, bone tissue is continually being broken down and replaced. Sex hormones are essential to initiate and maintain this process within the decline in production of sex hormones in both sexes after middle age. Bones become notably thinner and more porous. Other factors that influence the development of osteoporosis include smoking, corticoid steroids, treatments, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and overactive thyroid and long-term kidney failure. Um, so let me be more specific about the group or who is at risk. Most often age postmenopausal women. So about 30% women Six, ages 60 to 70 are uh, at greater risk. The percentage increases by the age of 80 to 70%. 30% of Caucasian women will fracture bones because of osteoporosis versus um, other ethnic groups. Men to a lesser degree will suffer from osteoporosis. It is just more prevalent in women. Um, sex hormones maintain your normal bone growth and density. So again, um, supplements of testosterone and estrogen may um, provide some support in um, fighting off osteoporosis. And then, twenty-six. 
27. Uh, 27 I've pre-populated. So um, I've provided you a list with traditional treatments, such as calcium, vitamin D supplements, and weight-bearing exercises, hormone replacement therapy, um, slows bone loss but does not reverse it, controversial due to the increased risk of heart attack, stroke, and breast cancer. Some take estrogenic compounds in soy as a substitute. And then finally, what is Paget's disease? Paget's. All right, so it's characterized by excessive and haphazard bone deposits and reabsorption. The newly formed bone called pagetic bone has hastily made, I'm sorry, is hastily made and has an abnormally high ratio of spongy bone to compact bone. Um, so because the bone is more porous, because it was made so quickly, um, it's not as strong as uh, typical bones would be. Um, you have a occurrence of this in, usually in the spine, the pelvis, the femur, and the skull. And you usually will not see uh, Paget's disease present in anyone before the age of 40. All right, and so this slide provides you with um, normal spongy bone and then bone that has um, been created as uh, an occurrence of Paget's disease where it's very poorly formed. Um, the structures are still there, but they're, they're very weak. All right, well, this ends chapter six, part B. Um, hopefully you will find this video helpful um, as you are preparing for your, um, your exam two. Feel free to refer back to the video um, to get some additional notes. Thank you.